September 28th, 2017 PRAC meeting. And we'll start with the introductions. Lisa Dolzak. Doug Meaden. Sean Dashler. Roger Fowler Tice. And Chris Cook. Denise Conrad Stapp. Okay. And next item on the agenda is the approval of the meetings from July 27th. Has everybody had a chance to read them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next <coughs> item on the agenda <coughs> is uh, any citizen comments or items not on the agenda tonight? Doesn't appear to be any. Okay, our first presentation is on uh, McLaughlin uh, Trail by Kelly Reed. Thank you. Um, can you share the screen for me? having me here tonight. Um, Phil and I have been working very closely on this project and um, he would have presented this to you, um, but you get the next best thing, I guess, um, because I'm available. Uh, so my name is Kelly Reed. I am a planner with the city and the community development department. I've uh, been with the city for five years. So just so you know, we can't see this down here, so we're gonna turn around. Oh, we're not ignoring you. Oh, I'm so here. sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> Um, so the McLaughlin and Kanima Trail Plan uh, is an uh, effort to find an alignment uh, and, and overall kind of concept design for a trail connection uh, that connects the McLaughlin Promenade to the Kanima Children's Park. And so what I have up here on your screen is our um, transportation system plan map that shows a series of different projects uh, that um, result in a connected trail. And these were adopted uh, back in 2013. Uh, and so as you can see, that all it is is a line on a map. Um, and so you can kind of see the little purple dash line near the um, museum and then a yellow line um, through some property through Old Kanima Park and then another purple dash line through Kanima. And uh, we're kind of tying all those together into one cohesive trail and then figuring out where it actually is gonna go because these lines were drawn without a whole lot of real um, input from the community. Um, it's meant to be, those lines are meant to be like high level and that they would be refined. And so that's what this project was doing is to refine um, and add more detail to um, the overall trail plan. So the, um, McLaughlin Kanima Trail is really a segment of a, what is a larger Oregon City Loop Trail that uh, loops all the way around, um, kind of connecting the Willamette Terrace and the um, Riverwalk, uh, the Promenade, all the way south um, in the South End area around the edge of the city to the community college and then kind of back up north. Um, so as you know, a lot of that trail system does not exist currently, but it is in our trails master plan as, a, as the loop trail. And so this is a little segment um, that could, you know, we thought would make a lot of sense, especially as the, we're, uh, you know, we've got a river walk design that includes a pedestrian bridge up to the promenade. And so um, this connection would, would directly connect to that and allow um, Kanima neighborhood to directly connect to the Riverwalk in downtown. Um, and, you know, really um, bring together our different historic districts. So, uh, we embarked on a process and I wanna thank um, Lisa Novak and Doug Mealy. Uh, we're part of the um, advisory group uh, that just finished the process and made, um, and ended with, uh, you know, agreeing on a recommendation for the trail alignment. Um, and I want to thank Roger as well um, for uh, the help and participation with the Old Kanima Park cleanup and the Greenway for a day, um, which was really fun. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, so looking at the existing conditions um, out there where this trail alignment is, this is along 99E 
in between the museum and um, Old Kanima Park. Um, we don't have great conditions for, for people walking and biking. Um, people do use this now, we know, uh, but it's not really comfortable, safe, or attractive. Uh, and, and so we're, we're looking at different alignments, but also um, you know, how can we make the existing conditions more uh, safe. Now, this is a PGE substation that's just a little south of there, um, right next to Old Kanima Park. Uh, so we worked closely with PGE, and they are um, willing to work with the city and, and um, discuss easements so that people can pass through the PGE proper, property instead of trespassing through. Uh, and then, of course, Old Kanima Park, um, hidden gem of Oregon City. Uh, and then in the Kanima neighborhood, this is a um, Third Avenue, um, very narrow streets, no sidewalks. Again, it's not, it, it, it's pleasant, but it's not necessarily um, safe. You know, people sometimes feel that traffic can move quickly through there, and so they don't necessarily feel comfortable letting their kids, you know, walk on the streets, things like that. So um, we're, we're looking at creative solutions in Kanima to um, align the trail on the existing streets in a way that, that allows for a shared street. Um, and instead of um, adding sidewalks, because we've been down that road before, I think many years ago, and um, the Historic Review Board in the Kanima neighborhood um, determined that uh, sidewalks and curbs aren't really compatible with the His uh, National Register Historic District. Uh, and so even though we have a really wide 60-foot right-of-way, um, and presumably you'd have room to build sidewalks, um, it, it wouldn't fit in with the character, and so it's not an option. Uh, we also looked at um, other alignments along South End Road. Uh, this is walking um, up the kind of gravel shoulder on High Street to South End that then kind of leads up to Fifth Avenue in Kanima. Um, this was actually uh, quite um, an interesting alignment and a lot of, uh, you know, there were good reasons to choose this one as well. Um, um, but I'll talk about which ended up being the recommended alignment. Uh, and then using the existing boardwalk along 99E was also uh, um, looked at. This is um, members of the committee uh, of the advisory group standing on 99E in Kanima waiting to, or I think we just crossed the street um, there. There's no safe crossing, um, but there is a plan for a signal or um, for a flashing beacon, I think. Um, and a crosswalk there eventually. Um, but that that uh, part would be part of an alignment if we use that boardwalk along 99. Uh, and then this is uh, 4th Street in Kanima. This is part of our Greenway for a Day event that we held um, in July. Uh, we invited the neighbors out to participate in Greenway for a Day, and we actually um, blocked off the streets in Kanima, and we marked the trail between the museum and Kanima Children's Park. And um, over, uh, I think it was about 80 people came out uh, and, and walked the trail, brought their kids, brought their dogs. Um, and we also coincided that with a cleanup um, ivy pole at Old Kanima Park that Roger helped to organize. Uh, and so there, there were a few dozen people out to help with that. And that was a um, really great event. You know, people got to see the opportunity um, and also experience kind of some of the hairy situations on the trail, like walking through PGE and walking through on 99. Um, and, you know, they're kind of realizing that, yeah, we this needs to be improved. Uh, so uh, with that event, we had um, information about the trail. We had, um, we asked people to take a survey and to uh, kind of show their preferences for different safety treatments and safety solutions. Uh, so that's what these folks are doing here at um, Kanima Children's Park. Uh, and then um, just recently the, the committee uh, looked at three major alignments. We had lots of different segments that we talked about, but these are the um, overall three concepts that were considered. So this is one that uses that boardwalk along 99. So you would cross 99 you know, go to the little overlook, walk through the overlook where you can stop and see the falls, and then continue on the boardwalk uh, and cross 99 at Jerome Street there in Kanima, and then wind your way through the neighborhood. Um, there are stairs from third to uh, almost to where Kanima Children's Park is, 
Um, but we're trying to provide an alignment that works for people on bikes and people with strollers and people in wheelchairs. And so we're trying to avoid the stairs there, um, which is why you see it kind of wind all the way around and go to Fourth Avenue. Uh, alignment B um, utilized kind of the route that we took during the um, Greenway for a Day event, which is kind of the only, well, um, the probably safest available route currently, um, as long as PGE lets us through, which they did for this event. Um, so we're uh, going along the uh, highway and then cutting through the PGE property into Old Kenema Park and then utilizing the streets in Kenema. Uh, and then the third option was um, going up to High Street, kind of bypassing the museum area, um, and then continuing up South End Road uh, to Fifth Avenue in Kanima. And then there is there are lots of um, there's lots of right of way in Kanima that's not built as street, and it's just you know steep slopes that people kind of use as their backyards or front yards. And so um, we thought maybe going through some of that right-of-way since it's there um, would be an option, but um, there are some steep slope issues and some um, environmental issues uh, in that area as well. Um, so the group, you know, weighed all these options. We set some goals for the trail. We, um, you know, we agreed on those goals and then we evaluated these three alignments based on those goals and ended up um, with a recommendation for alignment B um, with some uh, additional kind of caveats that there be a lot of safety improvements made here before we're comfortable with this being a trail. Uh, so with the safety improvements include um, dealing with the VFW driveway here. If you ever have walked down that driveway or driven up, you know, it's one way, um, about 12 feet wide, so you can't pass each other if you're in a car. Um, and it's really steep. And so um, we're saying, that's, a, that's an issue. We talked about potentially moving that access to the VFW to First Street right here, um, and maybe having cars go in to the parking lot that way, and then making this pedestrian only. Um, that needs further study, but that's a recommendation of the group that the city um, investigate that potential. Um, we talked about closing off that left turn um, from 99 onto Tumwater. Uh, so that if people are walking um, right here, that you don't have cars whipping in there and coming in at high speeds. Um, we uh, talked about a, a need for a safer crossing of South Second, um, whether it's crossing at Tumwater or crossing at um, McLaughlin. Um, it, you know, people didn't feel like it was all it was all that great uh, right now, um, and so that can be improved. Um, there is an option in the long term to take the trail behind, like along Tom Water here, and come behind this stuff and then cut up to, um, back up to the, the highway and go in front of PGE. And the way that would happen would be in the long run, a lot of these properties are zoned for mixed use and we, uh, we anticipate that they will redevelop in the future. And so when that happens, um, they would likely get access uh, potentially from an, uh, parking lots behind or some sort of alleyway back here because we, um, ODOT always wants to limit curb cuts and things like that in, in our state highways. So access from behind is um, ideal. And so in that, in that case, we could align the trail with whatever alleyway or parking lot access goes behind that development. Uh, and what we discussed with that option is that, you know, we would make a safe crossing here at Tumwater and South Second um, we would align that trail and then we would make sure that the development doesn't turn its back on that trail. Uh, you know, you don't want the back of a building with no windows um, and, you know, it kind of doesn't really feel very safe or secure if you're on a trail like that. But if you have, you know, for example, you have uh, the Falls View Tavern, I think, a restaurant and they have back patio seating, you know, that's perfect, right? Like outdoor seating for a restaurant that's right along a trail um, would be a really nice environment. So could take that behind um, the development or in front of, um, but go in front of PGE through Old Kanima Park. Um, in Old Kanima Park, there we would widen the, the existing walkway. I think it's maybe, maybe six feet wide now. And so we're looking at more of a 10 to 12 foot wide trail so that folks can pass each other. So it's nice and wide.
We would widen that and flatten it out because if you've walked in there recently, a lot of the tree roots are right at the surface and they've created these huge ripples in the trail surface. And so um, we have to remove those trees probably to get those roots out and to widen the trail. Um, so that, those are the improvements in Old Kanima Park. And the, the group also identified as an issue the, the parking lot. Um, you know, probably want to improve that a little bit in the form of maybe striping. But then the little driveway that goes into the Old Kanima Park parking lot is also kind of steep and a little bit unsafe. Um, and so we, if, if anybody here has any ideas for, for that, we're all ears because we didn't really get a chance to talk in great detail about how we could improve that driveway, um, but we know it's an issue. And then in Kanima, we would add on the street, um, share row markings, other sort of signage to indicate shared use um, in the presence of pedestrians. You know, people walk there now, of course, um, they live there and kids walk to the bus stop and all that, but um, if we can slow traffic down even more and make it safer, you know, that's all the better. So we talked about um, potentially adding speed humps, stop signs, changing the speed limit to 20 miles per hour, um, and using visual narrowing with uh, just paint on the street to kind of um, indicate a narrower street for people to slow down. So all of those things um, will be, uh, you know, we're working with our public works department um, to talk about, you know, how we can do those and, and make um, Fourth Avenue, Ganong, uh, a bit safer to, to walk on. Um, and then, of course, the trail would end at Kanima Children's Park um, and into, you know, of course, lead people into Kanima Bluff. Uh, Metro um, was on our committee. Uh, they had a representative on our committee. They actually funded uh, this project through a grant. We got a $25,000 grant from them to do this plan. Um, and then they agreed to also be on the committee. Um, and one of the discussions uh, that came up, of course, was parking for Kanima Bluff. And Metro just wanted to um, really, uh, let everyone in Oregon City know that in the next um, handful of years in their kind of uh, in their outlook of what projects they would be working on, they do plan on um, tackling Kanima Bluff with a full um, access master plan. Uh, so the, the planning that they've done is only right at that entryway where they did the little trail. Um, but they have a very large property and they don't have um, long-term plans for it. Um, and so they would do an access master plan which would, would look at other trailhead uh, opportunities and parking lot opportunities. They do have um, some land that's further south on 99, um, down by some of those industrial businesses down there, and I think there might be a mobile home park. Uh, they have a piece of property that could serve as a trailhead a parking lot, which would relieve any pressure from the Kanima trailhead. Um, of course, it's not in the very near future. It's a little ways out, but it's nice to know, I think, for especially the Kanima neighborhood. Uh, let's see. So um, I talked about the, some of the tree removal that might have to happen in Old Kanima Park. Um, this is just an example of a shared use path that's along um, an ODOT uh, facility elsewhere in the state. Um, so I think that's probably a 10 or 12 foot wide path and we would be going for something like that um, along 99. Uh, and then um, I also wanna just mention to you since this is a city park, uh, the Promenade Park. Um, so we're looking at 2nd Street from the Promenade. There's a grassy area and, uh, you know, people kind of walk through here, but there's no paved connection. And um, knowing that the crossing of South 2nd is currently safest right there at that four-way stop um, at High Street and South 2nd, um, we're thinking in the in the short term, before we can really get a lot of funding and get all of this whole trail built, that we we still want to do some improvements and and make an interim trail. And so what we one thing we could do is um, route people onto High Street to cross South Second at High Street, and then they can walk the rest of the way um, along that sidewalk and then 99 if we make some improvements there too. 
Uh, so we might, um, we've talked about, you know, paving a connection from the promenade sidewalk to this little dead end here um, so that it's ADA and so that, you know, it's a smooth surface. Um, so that might be something that would happen more in the near term to um, start on an interim trail. Uh, so these um, projects that are in our plans and um, the project that the the trails master plan as well will be officially um, updated and refined um, with an adoption of this master plan. And so this adoption schedule, um, this is tentative, uh, but what, would, what it would be, it would be an amendment to the trails master plan and to the transportation system plan to really turn those lines on the map into more of a or an actual concept plan. Uh, and so we go to the planning commission with that um, in November and then the city commission in December. Uh, and then our next steps would really be um, starting to do some of those interim improvements, identifying additional grant funding that we could um, find to start to implement. Um, and of course, there's a little bit more engineering work that needs to be done and design work to really figure out, you know, if we're gonna widen the trail in Old Kenema Park, you know, which trees need to be removed and, you know, what's our, um, what side of the trail are we just widening this way or are we gonna try and adjust the location of the trail a little bit to maybe get better um, ADA routes. Um, and uh, there's a, a little bit of geotechnical work that needs to happen because there are some slope, of course, the bluff that comes down to 99, um, the trail will be kind of close to the edge there in some places. And so we'll need to do some um, reinforcement. Uh, so a little bit more engineering and design work needs to happen and then um, we can move into construction but really the first step is getting this officially adopted and on the books uh, and um, it will also getting this adopted into the plan will also allow the city to um, exact any land from developers if we would wanted to put it behind that development when that redevelops on 99 um, we need this adopted so that we can legally um, work with those developers in a way that allows us to say, okay, you're building this, you know, apartment building or mixed use building, and um, we want you to, you know, build a trail behind it as a piece of this McLaughlin Kanima Trail. So um, with that, that's just a nice picture of our committee. Um, any questions about, yes? So Kelly, putting that on the books as adopted, does that also provide opportunity for grant funds? Yeah, that's helpful with grant funds. If we um, have it officially adopted by the city commission, um, we can you know, point to it and point to our updated trails master plan and say, you know, this has been, this was a community uh, supported process um, and there's political support behind it as well. Yes. I'm, I'm sure that most of us are pleased that we're looking at the old Kanina Park as being part of it. Mm -hmm. um, can we kind of guarantee that improvements in, in the rest of the loop will be made for people that just want to walk around old Kanina Park? I'm not talking about a 12 foot pathway, but uh, to have the rest of the trail there uh, and make, make it look more inviting. Oh, in, all, in the entire park? Hmm? In the entire park? Yeah. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really talk about that. Um, that would probably be some a conversation that we'd have to have with Phil and, uh, you know, if it makes sense to, if you're going in to improve the trail, a portion of the trail, maybe it's more cost effective to do all of it at the same time um, if there's funding there. But I think it's a discussion to have with um, with Phil. The, and the, one of the issues with the upper portion of that loop um, because the lower, the portion that we're going to be using for the trail alignment is kind of closer to the edge 99 there and it's flatter. And if you go up the loop, if you ever walked that, that circle, it gets really steep up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was one of the reasons that we didn't look at sure. using that. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again to those of you who participated. Thank you, and Thank you. I think probably people here remember we sent in a letter of support to get that grant funding to uh, PRAC. Yeah.
Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. So Kelly was also going to um, do a quick update on the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. Yeah, we're moving one item up. So we are moving that item up. And let me get the agenda back. There we go. Yeah, so um, moving um, to the 17 514. Yeah, uh, Willamette Falls Legacy Project okay. update. Okay. Um, yeah, so I also work on that project. So I'm just since I happen to be here, I told Denise I could I could give a quick update. Uh, we have a lot of ongoing work uh, with that. Um, I, I'm sure you know we had, uh, unveiled the um, Riverwalk design concept in June, uh, and since then we've been working on putting together um, a master plan based on that design, um, kind of documenting the whole process and all the work that we've done in the past two years, kind of compiling it into one report um, to be adopted by Metro and Oregon City um, to move forward. Uh, so we've been working on that. Um, we've been doing some structural assessment out at the site to uh, look in more detail at some of those buildings that we're proposing to use um, for phase one. Um, some of the structural supports to make sure those um, can be used um, or what kind of reinforcements they would need. Uh, we've been doing some weed treatments uh, out on the site in um, cooperation with PGE and the property owner. Uh, and um, of course, as you know, there are a lot of hazardous um, building materials, asbestos and lead in a lot of those buildings. And so we have a brownfield grant um, that has allowed us to do some brownfield assessment work and figure out really what contamination is in those buildings and um, how to abate it when demolition occurs. Um, we've been working on um, permit applications for the Riverwalk. Um, there are a lot of different permits that are needed, including federal, state, and local permits. Um, and uh, lastly, um, Metro is going to go out with a design build RFP to find a contractor um, for phase one. Uh, and so that um, they decided on that uh, recently, and then the staff at Metro are now working on putting together that request for proposals um, to go out to the kind of contractor and builder community. Have there been any uh, updates on the permitting process since the stories hit the press about the, the news. disagreements? Um, there hasn't been any, uh, I, I don't have anything new to share um, other than, you know, all four partners are still really committed to the project um, and committed to the partnership itself. Uh, and they're investigating different options to allow us to move forward with the Riverwalk. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, Kelly. So we just got to switch presentations here. Are you guys comfortable looking that close? Not really. <laughs> Do you want to move no, to the fine. audience and look at it that way? I just have to look down once in so a while. Should we get next straight? I know. I'm, I'm feeling like this is not ergonomic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the uh, community services facilities? This is actually um, probably a little history. Under community services, one of my divisions is building facilities, and that is building facilities citywide. So, um, when I originally was hired as the Assistant Parks and Recreation Director, this was not a portion of the position. Uh, I think it was a byproduct of being somewhat dangerously, slightly knowledgeable um, and willing to uh, tackle a few challenges that were occurring in existing buildings that um, I was utilizing. So um, the trailers that were in the old city hall there's three temporary trailers that the police now use for their police staffing. One of those trailers was my first office. And um, embarking to my new position, walking in my office, my heel went through the floor. 
and my window started to fall out. So uh, being an old farm girl and uh, kind of a fix it kind of girl said, hey, do you guys mind if maybe we take a look at this? Um, and it just kind of has morphed over the last 10 years into something that I'm actually good at, um, enjoy doing, and we've been able to make a lot of progress in the city um, with very, very little resources. So that's kind of the, the gist of how I ended up with it as part of one of my divisions. So um, subsequently, there's funding that's a little more identified within budgets for building facilities. And um, we're hopefully gonna start making a little bit more progress in, in that realm. Um, it's a slow boat because obviously staffing is always an issue and so is budgets. So we'll kind of run through this and if you guys have questions along the way, feel free. But if you are getting neck cramps, feel free to go to the audience and view. Um, so this is kind of our hierarchy, although under me, I actually don't direct parks maintenance or cemetery. That actually, that line should go directly to Phil, um, the director. And it's always been that way, um, except for when I was the interim park maintenance manager. So if you take a look at um, our FTEs, you can see kind of how we fall. So city facilities, these are all the city facilities that we have. We have 12 city facilities that are under our purview as far as facility maintenance. Uh, it does not include public works, water, sewer facilities, or park shelters, restrooms, things out in the parks themselves. Our building facility staff is small. So I am the division manager. We have one full-time amazing gem, Ann Crandall. She is hands down the hardest working gal I've ever met. Um, very knowledgeable, and if she doesn't know it, she'll study it and she'll figure a way to do it, and she does it with the best bang for the buck, and she can make a penny squeeze dimes. So uh, she's amazing. Um, we have Dale Smelzer, who's at our pool specifically. He's a half-time employee, also amazing for the amount of time he has to do what he does. So all together, we have 1.5 FTEs for 12 buildings. Uh, with those 12 buildings, we have 288,000 square feet of facility. That means that we have 1.5 people doing that many square feet, which really relates to us not doing that many square feet. Uh, if we do what is called rentable square feet, it's one FTE to 47,000 rentable square feet. And that's the 2005 industry standard. So we're giving a 12 year grace on that. <laughs> So it's probably a margin of small difference. As buildings get more technologically savvy, um, it's a different change in how you manage buildings. So our buildings aren't technologically savvy for the most part. They're all fairly antiquated buildings. We have new buildings with City Hall, the library, and we're getting there with some of our other buildings. But technically, if you look at our square rentable square feet, we should be at about six, ish FTEs. So the reality of the capacity of what we do in our division is uh, reactionary maintenance. We have been able to get to a point where we're able to do some basic preventative maintenance or PMs. Um, we're mostly repair and replace and basically planned replacement or forecasted maintenance as we can. Again, with just the 1.5, it's really hard for us to get ahead of the ball game since we are starting so far behind in deferred maintenance of buildings. What does that mean in terms of building facility maintenance? This is kind of our list of what we have um, in our capacity to try and get to. Uh, obviously, we're not getting to all of it, and there's still a lot of deferred maintenance out there, but we really are trying to really focus on the safety aspects, code compliances, and anything else that we can get our hands on. And a lot of times we'll commingle projects. If it's a code compliance, but we can hit this other area at the same time and it saves us some budget, we really try and package up our projects as well as it saves us time in the long run if we can package them. A lot of our systems that we have on a regular basis throughout our buildings are listed there. Um, again, because we have a lot of different buildings, there's some anomalies. So the Pioneer Center, it's an older building. 
Um, I want to say it's a 70s building. Uh, basically, when I came here, the building was pretty quiet. So our total visits from 2004, about when Kathy started, was about 99,000 annually. And we've jumped up to 132 annually. The big bang for the buck theory here is our capital improvement investment over that time has been pretty small. But if you look at our donation funds, we've utilized 80,000 in donation funds. And that's Kathy's bake sales, hot dogs, popcorn, garage sale money, small dollars coming in. And then a lot of our um, going out for the Meals on Wheels donations and our annual giving program that we send our letter out for. And that's how we've built up our donation funds. So that donation, those donations include the Meals on Wheels? We have some Meals on Wheels um, donations. So if it was like for um, our refrigeration or our packaging, things that apply to Meals on Wheels, mm -hmm. then we could use donation funds to help assist in finding equipment or things like that. Okay. So that's, that, that's the 80,000, that's part of the 80,000. 80, 80,000 over that amount of time. Yeah. So it's a small amount each year that yeah. we're utilizing, but we're also trying to garner those donations to keep funding in the donation account. So anytime the city doesn't have enough money in our general fund for something that we need, then we look to our donation account. So in the Pioneer Center, we have, um, it's a not a high level uh, building. So the commercial kitchen is probably one of our things that makes it a little bit different than normal buildings. And this is our commercial kitchen. It's a steam kitchen. We actually aren't a cooking kitchen. We just reheat re and re-steam. But we service our meals on wheels and our congregate meals in this building. And this is their rooftop. We have nine rooftop units. We've done a lot of renovations in this building since I've started um, in 10 years. So the top is what it used to look like, kind of an icy, uh, blue and I think it was lavender um, and the the carpet had duct tape holding it together in places so over the time between about 2007 2008 to present we have overhauled that building almost entirely on the HVAC 9 seems like a lot for that size of a building instead of a large unit is have they been added over time, is that why? Or was it designed uh, to have nine small units? It was designed to have nine smaller units. Uh, unfortunately, they were all set in place at one time. So their useful life expectancy all ends at the same time. So we're trying to do planned replacements incrementally so that we can start staging them out. So they are currently about at their end of their useful life. So we're staging out, I think, uh, two units here before winter. And I think we're looking at another couple units um, in the spring. Are they heat pumps or air conditioners? Uh, HVAC, so heat and cooling. And then there, we have a couple splits or furnaces on that in this building. What, so what a hodgepodge! It is a hodgepodge it, and air handlers. So 70s. Yeah. it's um, they're antiquated and they're older. So today's just modern systems versus what we had. The problem is structurally you can't put humongous units on top of, in place of the smaller ones because of your loads. Yeah. So we're kind of limited to what we can do to modernize, but even the modern HVACs have economizers, so then your energy uses come down. Yeah, yeah. So the more antiquated your equipment gets, the more money you start spending on energy as well as repairs. So we're trying to kind of hold them back into some energy efficiency as well as limit how much maintenance and repairs we have to put into them. I'm assuming you're looking like, or, or looking at like Energy Trust Corrigan or something like that for- A lot of them we can do uh, Energy Trust and some of them, it, the, it's marginal. Um, it's past through dollars for us, okay. typically for that. Uh, lighting will get us a lot on energy. So we definitely look to Energy Trust when we transfer things over. Um, definitely like when we did the library, the solar system, Energy Trust, was definitely a huge part in that. So we do partner with them on almost anything that we do that is related to energy or conversion. Nice. So we have multi-purpose rooms in this. Um, anything that is multi-purpose also equals high use. High use equals high maintenance. Um, we overhaul that floor. Um, we're probably, 
we might get one more overhaul on that floor. It's the original floor. So we've done uh, really well in keeping that floor for as long as we have, and we're hoping that we'll get one more, one more turn out of it. And if not, then we'll have to look at, you know, standard modern product to see what we can do that will still, our dancers are very specific about the coefficient of friction. So we'll see kind of what we can play out and what we can afford. But definitely it's a heavily used, very popular facility. So looking at hours of operation, this facility is used or rented seven days a week. Um, our general hours for our typical community is nine till four. And then we definitely still have contract classes that go till 9 p.m. Evening rentals can go to 11. And then our weekend rentals can be anywhere from eight to 11. They're typically about a six hour rental though. And that is dependent on our staff being able to be available as well. So I know some of you are very familiar with the pool. So the old pool used to be kind of a pink and blue gray um, when I got here. And um, from a curb appeal, not very appealing. Hmm. So uh, I think about 2008, um, I went, went ahead and got some funding and we painted it. Um, so this paint that you're seeing in the brown and red is from 2008 and we're probably a little bit past needing to do it again. Um, you usually get seven to eight years on a paint and we're, we're there. So uh, I think we're looking at starting to look at fiscal budgeting again to kind of start back over from where we started. So perspective, uh, total visits have gone from 76,000 to 141,000 last year. And the motto that we talked about when I came in is if we invest in our facilities, then people will reinvest in us. And it has rang true and we are full to capacity at the pool and we have no more water time to kind of move around or figure out where we can put anybody else. So we're max capacity. The budget reflection is slightly different because we had school lessons and when school lessons got cut, so did our revenue. But if you look at even with the losses of some of our school lessons, um, we've gotten some back, but we're definitely not where we used to be. Uh, our revenue has definitely climbed from where we started. And then our capital investment from 2006 to the present is about 1.6 million. And when we did the study for the pool, they were projecting over a million dollars in deferred maintenance. Um, I think we've done really well at 1.6 million for that time frame because construction costs have risen. So while the construction costs have risen, we have kept our dollar of deferred maintenance down. And that's just by really tightening our belts, looking at how we can adjust projects and what's our biggest bang for our buck to do and how to get it done. On the uh, school lessons, that, are we looking at that at, over time where that was a several year period where it was missing and it's been reinstated, right? Not fully. We have not fully reinstated every school like we had before. So school budgets are their school budgets and not all of them have come back. So, so are we talking other districts or are we no, talking just your, Oregon or, City schools. Are you saying that say Oregon City has eight of 10 schools have restored mm -hmm. but two haven't? Some, yeah, it, and it, it changes per year. So Rochelle could give us a little more detail on that. I didn't dive into the, the, the I numbers. I sit on the school budget committee and I thought we were providing all the lessons again. <laughs> we might be so. now, but this is over a time frame. Right, so and that's what I was, some I, more, I thought some it more, would yeah. come back. Yeah. So. Like if we looked at it going forward, that should be fully restored, I thought. I would have to check with Rochelle on that mm -hmm. because I, I know we do contracts ahead. True. So we're into a new, we're into, we're into school now. So gotcha. I would have to ask her to be specific. I wasn't, wasn't really into the record. I just want to make sure I understood the yeah. number though, that really that number could, will pick back up if we looked at it on a- Right, okay. on a curve. Okay. Yeah. So pool systems, um, the pool is, I guess, uh, one of our anomalies because we do chemicals. We have high rate sand filters. We have a UV um, sanitation system in that building. So we've modernized the systems in order to get the biggest bang for our buck in our water. We have some of the clearest water in the state, if not the region, um, based on the systems that we've put in place in our pool. 
So for an antiquated building and basically a rectangle pool, we are definitely one of the best um, environments of pools in the region. So it's one of our kudos we like to tout. So this is the old original boiler. And then in 2012, we got um, old green here. So the guys were talking about um, Thomas the Train. <laughs> so that's what we, we like in that one too. But the efficiency value between the old boiler to the new boiler is amazing. Um, and just the repairs necessary. So this is just right now, just regular routine maintenance and a few minor repairs in uh, almost, almost five, six years. So, so uh, UV sanitation is right in the middle of the screen. It's that um, horizontal metal cylinder. That is a UV light and the water passes through that and it breaks up the contamination. The white bucket in the top is our chemical feeder and those are puck chlorinators. The bottom is our um, main power grid for the pool. And then all the other things are filters and water circulation through our sand filters and UV. But so just Dale and Ann have to know all these systems inside and out. So yeah, we all just saw this on a tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So three months. Our big push over at the pool has been ADA compliancy. Um, we have the new changing rooms, which I know you guys got the tour and saw the changing rooms, and then the office. And I think, I don't know if the soundboard was up, which is on that far uh, left wall there. That's a bamboo sound wall. And because the acoustics are so atrocious in that building, we're trying to bring down the acoustic um, for people who are actually working constantly in a space. So the office is uh, phones and trying to talk to people and the acoustics have been something that we've been contending with. Screaming kids. Yes, <laughs> screaming kids. Open, uh, open air locker rooms to the office. So in the top are kind of the old to the news on the bottom. So uh, taking down our paint and repainting our pool, putting a new surface to it, uh, the old fencing to new fencing, the acoustics on the back wall of the pool on, this, on the actual deck areas, um, changing those to the acoustic treatments there, it makes a huge difference. Um, you can also see the new windows in the corner on the right on the bottom as well. So all of those things make a lot more efficiency of sound and energy in that, in that room. So the pool isn't just where we do aquatics. We also register all of our recreation programs. And then we have an indoor play area in that community room. So this, this room right here is a multi-purpose room. So we have Pilates and yoga and anything that we can smash in there. Our rentals are in there um, for the weekend for birthday parties and things like that. So another heavy use, high use building area along with our pool. And then down here is, we do a cooperative training with um, CCFD and they come in and our lifeguards get to train with them and that way fire knows what we're doing, we know what fire wants and then we're more efficient when we have to ask them to come in. Hours of operation. This building runs 96 to 100 hours a week. And so while we may be contracting open for swim teams and such, it's a high use facility and for us to be able to get in and do maintenance it leaves us very limited time. Again, Dale and Ann are amazing at utilizing their time as most efficiently as possible, knowing exactly when the windows of opportunities are. The library is another project um, I participated on with Mo, um, taking an old to a new, adding different elements to this building. It was a really fun project, an amazing product in the end. Um, the thing about these new old new buildings is we still do maintenance in them. So going old to new doesn't mean that it lessens our maintenance. This actually added to our load with an extended building. Um, so anything that you see, lights, floors, doors, all these things are ours to handle. 
and the hours of operation also limit how much time we can get in to a building since we don't have after hours staff. So along with this, the library comes with some, some new systems that we didn't have before. So automated doors, sump pumps, computerized environmental controls, which then we need to learn and get up to speed so that we can manage those and make adjustments as necessary. Access controls, video surveillance, all these things, um, they're a little bit shared, um, again, because we have such limited staff. So we work very closely with some of most staff to kind of coordinate some of those efforts. Modern systems. The solar panels are a new modern system on the library, which we don't have solar panels on any of our other buildings. So this is the test model of, you know, is this something we want to move forward with and continue on with? So they're monitoring and looking at how the solar panels are benefiting the city in terms of energy. Uh, because it is a bigger building, we have 20 HVAC units. So that also is a maintenance load. We may not have to actually touch each one of those. We have a contractor that will come in and change filters and do those types of things, but we manage that contract and we have to manage with that contractor if there's issues. So just kind of give you a feel for the inside of the building. Again, a lot of space, a lot of treatments, a lot of different things that we look at in terms of maintenance. Park Cemetery office. This one is, um, so I think most of you should have seen this. This, uh, these buildings right here, that's the office, which is the house. This building right here is the red tag shop. This is our 1950s um, block restroom, public restroom. And then this right over here is our only existing shop area to work in and or store. All of our other stuff, because the shop is red tagged, or the big shop is red tagged, is all being stored within um, different sites throughout the park systems and our restrooms and storage facilities within each of those parks. So it makes uh, productivity a little bit stiff. My neck. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to go fast. <laughs> so again, uh, antiquated buildings, nothing special as far as our um, systems there. But still, uh, antiquated means maintenance and repair. This is what was shown to the commission um, a while ago as our original. This would meet our existing needs, but it doesn't facilitate anything in future. Uh, the commission has asked us to come back with half again to a third again that size, and then something for a 20 to 50 year option. So we'll be going back to them uh, October 10th, I believe, to talk about that. And I know Phil will be discussing that with you as well. Uh, cemetery mausoleums are also buildings that uh, we're looking at. They need maintenance. They have to be maintained. The old 70s mausoleums are in severe decline for the roof structures. Um, they've had some repairs, but they're just needing to be taken care of. There are five of these larger or excuse me, for these larger structures and want this one up here is some smaller structure, but it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of building roof. And then the newer mausoleum, it's in the nineties. It's going to start needing some definite maintenance over time as well. I and mean, roof structures are 15 year, 20 year, some are 30 year projections, but in the seventies, I think we're well past that. Oregon City City Hall, another project that I did, um, Daly's on-site project um, work with the construction managers and supervisors here, and did this one from start to finish with Scott Archer. Um, this one was definitely a highlight uh, for my career to do and enjoy doing this one because it was uh, what's considered a tenant improvement. However, it was an extreme tenant improvement. So this is the old building, the old clinic. This is what we purchased it looking like, as it had some tenant improvements already installed. And then this is what we started. And this is what we ended up with. So this one has automated light systems, key card access controls. We have video surveillance here, alarm systems. There's a generator, emergency generator backup. Um, there's automated doors. And then the anomaly of this one is that it's an, a lead standard silver. So there are some restrictions on how we 
use our energies and, and then change things if we change energy efficiencies and, and how we're um, looked at in terms of the LEED standard. Mount Pleasant School Site is also one of ours to handle. Um, it is <coughs> an owner lease facility, Merrill Hurst Schools in there currently. They just hired their own janitor maintenance, well, janitor slash maintenance person um, to kind of help address some of their needs because Ann just couldn't keep up with things that were breaking and needing to be addressed that are more a lease person's option to take care of. Um, it's an antiquated facility. The cost of repairs are expensive. Um, it is going to transition into demolition for the new police facility. So we're not spending a lot of money on it, but we're tr we have to stay within code compliance and those types of things, especially with the school on site. Uh, this is an item that we contend with um, because there are subgrade sump pumps and when they fail, you don't know they fail until they're done. And then we find these. So uh, it is a boiler, two air handlers, the compressor, eight electrical heaters in the classroom areas and then <coughs> HVACs. So we get to play with this beautiful 1940s boiler. <laughs> and I think that air handler is something very similar in time. Uh, that black thing looks like a tank. It's actually an air handler. And then behind that are the some subgrade sump pumps. So, and then the compressor in the back corner on the right here. So again, Anne is an amazing gem because she's been playing with all of these pieces of equipment primarily on her own. I dabble occasionally, but I am definitely not to the depths of where Anne's at and able to handle all these things. This is the current Oregon City Police Department and soon to transition. That used to be, uh, as you guys know, Old City Hall. So it's about to, I'm not sure what the future of that building will be, but hopefully not another city building. <laughs> uh, that one has 12 units, uh, smaller units on it. And a lot of those are at the end of their useful life as well. So we would like them to continue to move forward with their new buildings um, so that we don't have to touch those and spend money that you know, just won't go anywhere. So this is their concept. I know they have some more fancy pictures, um, but this is kind of what we, we're just kind of reeling through this. So that Mount Pleasant site will transition into uh, the police building. The annex that is there is also transitioning into the community development office and police will retain a portion for their um, training facilities. So this is the old annex. These are the systems in it. It's pretty small, pretty easy for right now, although old. This is what it looks like inside. So they have the, the gym and training facility in there, as well as those two classrooms, which are transforming into the office area for planning and building. And their concept that they've shown commission. Public Works is another building. Operation systems, it's pretty simple. It's an old building, so simple systems. Um, still high maintenance because they are antiquated and old, uh, as well as these, which I won't talk too much about. Uh, they have a concept plan to move forward with new buildings and facilities, which again will impact us and their concept plans that they've shown commission, all in process. End of the Oregon Trailer is uh, owner operator agreement right now for operational use of the site. So we do the shell of the building and actually probably a little bit more um, because we still own the site. It's, this is the visitor center. We just finished the roof last year on the visitor center and the shelter. Um, these are the interior shots and then some of the actual uh, concert in the park. And then uh, Gail with the end of the Oregon Trail has been doing camps and school groups. So they actually use the outside facilities as well. They've done a beautiful job on the interior and they are doing a lot of stuff and they have grants and funding that they're um, monopolizing or kind of garnering and trying to get more stuff done on the inside. So the top is what it used to look like with the hoops and the covers and what we have now is below. When we did the report in 2012, the deferred maintenance and renovation for the restrooms in some of the buildings, not all of the buildings, we've retained them all it was 1.2 million. So we're looking at um, from about 2012 to now about 30% more in construction cost. And these are some of the things that we contend with. Um, the HVAC systems are all at the end of their useful life. We have decking that we've replaced and just need to constantly maintain because it's a wood decking. 
the wood siding is also something that we're constantly having to contend with. Uh, I've proposed that we change some of that siding to something a little more sustainable. Again, it's more, it's a lot of money. So we're trying to figure out how to balance all of our deferred maintenance to moving into something a little more sustainable and, and less maintenance. But in that site, we're trying to look at um, compliances as well. As you can tell, extremely popular site for our concerts in the park. And it's like this, I think, all except for the 100 plus degrees that we had that one day. Mm -hmm. uh, Ermatinger is another one of our projects that I have done from, uh, I would have to say now, literally the ground up. So it's uh, a little bit more intensive, even though it's a simple building, um, because everything had to be uh, concealed due to the historic nature of the building. So everything that's in there is all concealed and makes it a little bit uh, more of a challenge to maintain. But uh, some snapshots of where we've come from to where we're now. Train Depot is also one of our facilities in the city. Uh, it's an owner operator or owner lease agreement currently, I think that may have ended. Yeah, it did. So uh, what it will be in the future, I'm not sure, but we still maintain the building, two HVAC security fire, and it has a commercial kitchen. So um, as just to wrap it up, 12 facilities, we didn't talk about parking lots, but we have nine parking lots that we maintain. Uh, we're looking at about four remodel or new facilities in the in process, and we still have 1.5 FTEs. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Did a lot of those numbers come from, or were they similar to what uh, Bill presented to commission during that work session a couple months ago when there was a discussion of park funding or uh, parks department funding? You, you know, uh, parks department funding is a little different. We'll do we're doing a deferred maintenance. Um, well, I guess hit Doug. Help me out if you can. Doug and I were at this work session. But it it was a very broad topic to fill, and, and it seemed like he brought up a lot of statistics that I hadn't heard before, like the uh, the rental square footage equivalent and how many people. He brought up a lot of those, so I assume those are similar or those the same. Those were probably numbers. from me. Okay. He probably took That's that from thought. some of the things I gave him. Uh, citywide building facilities are going to be different than our park deferred maintenance. Um, so park facilities. So park facilities are going to be Pioneer Center, Pool, EOT, um, Buena Vista. So he might have paired them down. So then. yeah, things are going to be a little bit different in terms of funding mechanisms because departments fund for their buildings. Um, we give them advice or we'll try and be collaborative with them. Um, the funding that gets put into the budgets are per department area versus a global building facilities budget line. So it's, it's, they're sectioned out. So we don't have, I don't control the budgets for those, but we definitely tell them what we think needs to be coming up and that may or may not get in the budget. Yeah. I, uh, first of all, I'm impressed. <laughs> I think yeah. this is really impressive yes. presentation. Uh, when, uh, before we started doing a lot of work on the pool, there was some discussion with going into a private uh, partnership with, I think, YMCA and so forth. That was years ago. Uh, the decision was to do the great job you've done at the pool. But you've indicated now it's at capacity. Is there any discussion about increasing the capacity in some way? Uh, there's been discussions all along the way. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, what are the priorities? Right. It's money. So... Yeah. I mean, do, is the discussion a new pool or is it doing something at site? I think when we did, I, it, prior to me being here, they did a um, survey of the community. The community did not want that pool to go away. Mm -hmm. They wanted to retain it. Yeah. So we've stayed with that um, vein of thought of retaining it. Um, are there options to expand? The property has some options of, you know, frontage to the backside where the community room is. Um, it has some frontage to where the existing waiting pool is, um, but what's the best course of action, best laid plans, I mean, community input definitely would have to be a startup point. 
but I don't think we're quite there yet with all the deferred maintenance we have in other areas as well. So with the pool being up to speed to the capacity it is, and we have high deferred maintenance in other areas, or I think our focus has been more to that degree. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna make a request at this point, never a future topic, but uh, at, at some future date, if we could uh, discuss the, the future of the urine retainer, how it's gonna be used, not today. I will put that on Phil's list. I believe he has that on his list as well. Okay. When it comes to the pool, kind of along those lines, it made me made me think if we're at capacity, do you do you still track? I I, I just I can't remember um, in city versus out city users. We do. I don't have that statistic though. No, and I, I don't, I, I'm not either. asking for it. So I guess the point is we know those numbers though, if we wanted to um, try to, if we needed to somehow address that the in-city users are given priority on things, we know that. And so we would maybe know how to strategically, you know, change pricing or priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there is a pricing structure for in-city, out-of-city. Right. That's what made me think yeah. of that. I, so I, I remember they that. used to. Yeah, we do have that. And then, um, you know, we, we have the swim teams and those folks, and that's not strictly Oregon City right. because there aren't that many pools around. So you kind of garner, you know, from the middle this way and from right. the middle this way um, for where the pools are at and location to what is feasible for people to, to get to for those activities. It's been such a success so far. It just makes me wonder if if there's a way to look at increasing, like strategically increase something. So like increase in city users by five or 10% by doing something, what would you do? And, you know, mm -hmm. something like that, because they're the ones paying the taxes on it. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right. Well, it's my concern with all the new development going on yeah. and it continues to increase. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of adding a facility or expanding, it made me think, well, maybe you just change the demographic or the user i think we'll still be at capacity even and you change in city to out of city you're still at capacity so we're not expanding how much we don't get more use of the facility mm -hmm. it's the same use numbers right. mm -hmm. just an in city or out of city focus oh i agree and that's so, that's how i guess my point from a prac standpoint or as a representative of the community i would encourage us to do whatever we can to make sure our community is serviced first. Uh, and I've seen that from my kids' swim lessons. That sometimes it's hard to get in. It's hard sometimes. Yeah, we didn't get well, in. Sure. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's. Um, and that's an example where maybe uh, in city registration starts a week ahead of time. Yeah. And you, we don't change funding, we just change. I'm, I'm challenging you, and, 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 and Rochelle, not throwing out a particular suggestion, but I'm wondering if. That's a possibility. And we've looked at we've looked at those options and discussed them um, at many points in turn. So yeah. it's not it's not a new concept. The closer we're, just, we're at a hundred percent, though, the you know when we're at eighty or ninety, it, right? Well, but when you're at a hundred, let's shift that line. Understood. <laughs> but it is amazing what it's how that's been changed. Will you have similar involvement with the new police station? I am not sure each department is in charge of their own buildings. Mo invited me in to work with her on the library. Okay. Um, Larry Patterson invited me in to work on City Hall. Okay. Um, as these other buildings are being produced, at some point we would like to be invited in. Uh, we don't always get in as early as we would like because obviously we're going to be the ones that maintain the systems uh, it, unless they choose to hire their own system maintenance people. So the options are open we're open to working with every department because we want to make sure that we help them as, as well as we can along the way and uh, obviously we've seen some pitfalls and some things that are highlights that work really well so we'd like to share so it, I, I would also encourage you to mention to phil that um, tonight was the first night that i had heard about the commission's desire to relook at the building at the cemetery mm -hmm. into more than what we were presented. So I'd be yeah. curious to, uh, you know, if something comes up between now and the next yeah. PRAC meeting, have emails I go out I think Phil has us. some updates for you guys. Yeah. So, uh, and then we great. sent one out this morning. So, in the email. I 
got so, an email from my yep. I think really good to hear it before the commission presentation. Uh, you know, I think a, a couple of us were there when that discussion took place. And uh, uh, one of the concerns that was brought up, it was dealing with the needs now rather than the needs in the future, and that came up. Uh, uh, and I, I guess I have two, two, two different concerns. I understand the needs in the future there. But when we're not meeting our current staff needs in, in, the, in the facilities, we need to put a priority on that. But uh, I, I presume when you make that presentation longer term, you were looking at a facility that is visually expandable so that uh, in the future we can accommodate more people there. I think um, I'll let Phil speak to, I wasn't. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not uh, I guess, at a point where I can say too much, um, but I know that Phil has some updates for you guys. I think that there's some discussions that I think will make things a little clearer, and I think it'll make it a little easier to, to understand where we're gonna be heading when we get to the commission okay, good. meeting. Well, and I, I, to kind of follow up, I, I did see an email from Phil this morning, but it was uh, Urban Renewal Commission and City Commission meeting, and I saw the subject and didn't catch the topic okay because the two right so i i figured that's a tomorrow read but it actually pertains to this whole discussion it does as, as it i will, look at it so I, I think that phil will give you guys some more updates prior to that meeting okay, good and we're all at least have him touch base with each of you <coughs> yeah, i did the same thing sean okay <laughs> yeah, <you're not> alone. <laughs> okay <laughs> well and he's doing it all from his iphone too so right. he, he it's a challenge so he, yeah <laughs> So uh, just as a wrap up to that, so I have building facilities, I have recreation, I have aquatics, I have senior services. Um, those are my divisions um, and I have a small staff and they're absolutely amazing. Rochelle Parsh does all the aquatics and the recreation, the concerts, movies with um, Melissa Turney. And then Kathy has been amazing at everything she does at the Pioneer Center, which is Meals on Wheels, Congregate Meals, classes, you name it. They are hands down a top notch staff and I wouldn't be um, able to say as many kudos about it. They're very hardworking people. Ann Crandall, Dale, Melissa, Rochelle, and Kathy. I couldn't have asked for a better staff. So I have to give my staff an amazing amount of kudos because we do so much with so limited resources and limited amount of time to do these things and they just run with it and they roll with me and when I came in uh, I know I was a freight train and they just kept up and we've just kept going and so for all the th all the years that I've been here these ladies and Dale have been just absolutely supportive and we have knocked out so much more than I think I could have with any other staff so kudos to my staff they probably already know, but let them know how much we appreciate their efforts. I will. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments on that? Okay. Moving on to Glen Oak uh, Park Naming Subcommittee. So Phil wanted me to just kind of touch base that the subcommittee would be including himself, Christina Robertson Gardner. Um, there would be somebody from Prague. I know that Mike Mitchell has expressed an interest. And so I think that is back to you guys to talk about um, the committee, the subcommittee. And then his other comment was to see what your comfort level was in sending information or meeting dates out um, to the CIC and other neighborhoods as they're available. So that was his talking point. Which neighborhood association is that in? Is it the it's in Mike's. Caulfield. 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 Yeah. And I think we can have more than one because um, I was intending to, to participate as well. Um, and definitely Mike. Um, Is that you volunteering? Well, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I've, I've always had an, a desire to, to sit on that one. That's the closest to my house, and I'm essentially in that neighborhood, too. Um, and then as far as CIC, I think, so the, really you're asking a question, are we in favor of kind of broadcasting? 
I think, I think what I would suggest is using that, and I forget what it's called, that scheduling tool thing that he sends out for... Uh, uh, oh, the voting? Yes. Or where you vote in. Yeah, and I don't remember what it's called, but yeah. it's, a, it's a meeting vote scheduling Do tool. Yeah. Sure. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that worked really well. And then get a consensus of the primary people, and then once we get a consensus, send it out to the CIC and the Neighborhood Association. Any other discussion on that? Okay. Summer events wrap up. So Rochelle gave me um, a note for summer event wrap up. Uh, concerts were average attendance of 3,500 to 5,000. The most highly attended was Folsom Prison and Johnny Limbo with um, 5,000 plus participants at that concert. So it was a very jam packed EOT. Mm -hmm. Um, split the Bucks raised uh, just about $2,700, and the best night they raised $906.07. Where does that go? Uh, split the Bucks, so half of it goes to whoever wins the right? raffle, and the other half goes to our um, funding to the concerts again. Okay, it directly recycles. Yep, recycled okay. back into the concerts. Um, Doug gives a lot of money to that. She's already working on the, um, the bands for 2018. So she called her crazy. She just wrapped up. And now she's securing bands for the next year. Uh, movie attendance, 500. Votes had 1,200 votes for, you know, which movies we would actually show this year. And she had a full sponsorship list done. So next year she um, knows that we want to start kind of looking at movies and how we adjust the movies or what are options we have to make movies a better venue and um, place to run them. So we have talked about some different options for next year. I'll be honest with you, I, I was there for the hottest day and I don't think there were 3,500 people there. No, <laughs> not um, <laughs> the at the concert? Yeah, at the June Bugs concert. Yeah, was that was, I think there might have been a few. <laughs> <laughs> some yeah, there diehards. Were, there was there definitely some was. diehards there. <laughs> that was a hot day. If I could make a couple comments, I, I had, had actually emailed Phil and asked for this on the agenda, and he said he was, I think he had already been thinking about it. But one, I would ask can, to consider bringing the June Bugs back. Yeah, mm -hmm. Specifically, they because they were very good, and mm -hmm. it was a bad day. Yes, they were good. Um, and secondly, uh, it really hasn't been discussed here, but I think it needs to be discussed in a little greater depth, and that's the, the um, security or supervision that occurs at the movies in the park. Um, it, it's become, um, kind of reminds me of an unsupervised Friday night football game where everybody drops off their kids and it becomes mm -hmm. a, a dark social event, and, and there were... There were definitely some issues. Numerous issues, and I think it's a great venue. Um, my opinion is the screen needs to be moved towards the parking lot, back on the first half. But I also would think maybe I've been thinking about this for a while, and that you know I don't see our reserve police officers there, so maybe some um, change in participation from the police department. Some, some we did actually have some participation of the police department. Okay. On a few well, you know, I, nice. I saw yeah. police officers, but I didn't see like a large reserve presence, for example. I was trying to think, how could you do this with minimal funding? When mm -hmm. the police reserves, you know, depending on how many reserves we have at a time, it's an allocation of um, staffing as well. Right. Um, summer's a little tougher and, you know, babies and, you know, so, you know, their priorities our, you know, higher safety level interests sometimes during the summer. Um, we're definitely looking at some options of um, how we can change that behavior pattern that was occurring. And at that point, uh, we're having discussions of venues, um, language in our advertisement, um, that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, once the, the, the young middle school kids, you know, they don't drive, uh, parents drop them off. We go to kick them out. Where do they go? Mm -hmm. You know, mom and dad aren't coming back for two hours or whatever. 
there's, there's some limitations to us. We have a venue for an event. Uh, we're not security, we're not police, we're not enforcement. However, yes, there's definitely issues at hand. We bring in the police um, as necessary, hopefully not as often as we, you know, we don't want to have to do that, but at the same time, behaviors will dictate what we have to do in turn as reaction. So we are definitely talking about what our options are, what, you know, what would be effective options to change behavior, but still provide opportunity for those teens to be there and enjoy themselves in an appropriate manner, um, I mean, and the families to enjoy themselves. Do we need I mean, chaperones? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's definitely some language that we're, we're looking into in yeah. terms of not just dropping your kids off. Yeah, and I would encourage yeah. possibly even reaching out. A former BRAC member is a middle school principal here now reaching out to the school district and find out what they do and how they, they address that. Um, I've even seen in our middle school emails uh, how they address, and I know it's summertime in this case, but how they address code of conduct when a middle schooler goes to the Friday night high school football mm -hmm. game. It's still, in other words, if you act up on at the Friday night football game, it can still you know be suspended on Monday kind of a thing. And I'm not saying that works here, but maybe those people have some expertise that we may not I think we're, we're open to discussions yeah. and, and looking at a wider vision of it. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, Phil's obviously watching us. So uh, he says naming policy is two members of PRAC with the okay. community services director and CIC staff liaison. Okay. So you are open to the option of two. Can I, can I go back to the movies again yes. here? Um, the, the sound is inadequate to the way people are spread out. Uh, it's really that's it, also it's, hard, item, it's hard to hear it. We're looking and at. And I realize part of that's my own hearing and probably <laughs> hearing. But, uh, but yeah. We're looking at technology as well. Good. So um, we're looking at it as a whole package in terms of what, what worked, what didn't work, what can we improve, um, cost value marketing on that, um, what our sponsorship levels are. So it's, it's a full package um, debrief or a hot wash. Um, once we finish a season and we get back into it in terms of, you know, what can we do better? Um, we do look at our options in terms of our staff resourcing and our funding. So those are, the, there are two limiter, limiters in this. Yeah. I just wanted to, I guess I haven't noticed the security issues that you have. I don't know exactly what they are. The teenagers tend to hang out the, where the playground equipment is and talk. The teenagers aren't there watching the movies for the, for the most part, but it's a great kid, way for ways for the teenagers to be. And uh, I haven't seen any problems over there. Uh, uh, so some of the people aren't watching, watching the movies, but they are still re re recreating in, in a form or another. And I, I, have, I just haven't seen anything that concerned me personally. I think there's definitely um, some issues that need to be addressed. Uh -huh. and we're obviously debriefing and hot washing with um, the police department as well as, you know, looking at what our options are moving forward to alleviate the behaviors that probably aren't conducive to families. Mm. So we'll try and see what we can do with that. Mm. Okay. Moving on. Um, open positions on PROC and applications. So the open positions are going to be Doug's position, Joyce, and Blaine, who has resigned. Um, it looks like Doug has reapplied, and we have one other application that has been submitted. Applications are open until August, excuse me, October 5th. And so if you know somebody or want to tap somebody or want to advertise to neighborhood associations, that those, you know, everybody's gotten the announcement, but it doesn't hurt to send out a reminder. And so I, October 5th is, is the deadline. Right? Pardon? Joyce is not. Joyce is not. That well, I I can't confirm that. She, she told me that Saturday. Okay. So if you then you're a, more aware. Yeah. Okay. So um, at that point, you know, we're still looking for applications to be submitted. You show up to the meetings anyway. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. We would never be accepted by the mayor. So <laughs> if, you, if you put your wife up, would you know? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't have an alias. That's up until I'm sorry, October. 5th. October fifth. 
So Katie Riggs is taking those in now. And we would review those applications at the next meeting? You would be looking at your November, December. You're usually, you do a combination work session, PRAC meeting, um, review those applicants um, and or if you want to, I don't know how you guys and Phil will work this, but uh, the applications will be in by October 5th. Mm -hmm. There's the potential that you can review them and call in for interviews. Um, and that way they can be appointed at the commission meeting. I think it's December, January. Well, generally, if, if memory serves me, the October meeting is usually a six o'clock work session, seven o'clock meeting, because the November meeting is interrupted by Thanksgiving, which means we really do a, a joint December. first week of December. And yeah, so. We've, we've done it both, but we try to do the end of October. If it, I'm pretty sure you guys will have communication with Phil between now and then in terms of how you guys want to pursue looking at applications, doing interviews, yeah. and putting that together. So I'll leave that to you guys and Phil to fetter out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You'll be watching on TV that night. Not likely. Either <laughs> <laughs> general business? I have none. Member reports. We'll start down here. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I continue to be impressed um, by the city, the city parks. I think everyone is doing a great job. Thank you, Denise, Thank you. for your presentation. A uh, couple of issues, specifically close to home for me, uh, Park Place. Um, I was reading on the report that we're looking into the water, water drainage problems. Um, so th that is an issue, um, you know, neighbors are concerned about with winter coming up, any slipping, um, that sort of thing. Um, now that the, uh, we have longer nights, I'm out there every morning at 6 a.m., it is dark. And I'm wondering if we could look at better lighting. And I know that's, you know, um, budget is tight and so on, but um, the park is being utilized and um, it would be nice to brighten it up a little bit more, um, make visibi better visibility. Um, there is a building there. Um, the doors are locked, but it looks like um, it had been painted and cleaned up. The doors have been painted. Overall, the maintenance is going well. Um, I don't see any issues there. I don't see trash or anything like that. Um, I was real um, sad to hear about the graffiti at Wesley Lynn. Yeah. And does anyone know what um, otter means <laughs> on the building? Did you see, I don't know if anyone... It could be the person that tagged it. Oh, okay. Um, so I was really sad to hear about that, and um, I just hope it doesn't, uh, isn't a regular occurrence. Attended a few um, city uh, projects, um, was involved with, as, with Kelly and the Makima uh, McLaughlin Kanema Trail, combine the two. Makima, <laughs> Makima, <laughs> new word, That's new good. word. And I think the overall consensus um, was safety was a factor. And it seems like alignment B with conditions does seem to be the safest approach. I also wanted to look at it from the perspective of being a citizen of Kanema. And um, this does seem like the the. the the ideal route. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that. And I hope the project goes ahead. Kadima is a beautiful park. So that's all I have. Thank you. Doug? Um, of course, everybody's kind of concerned about uh, the invasive species in our parks. Uh, I was able to get up to um, Old Kadima Park, but after everybody left, <laughs> I had another meeting, but I spent some time there. But what I was noticing, and this is a this is a park that's been worked on, but uh, Singer Creek Park is uh, uh, having tro real trouble with uh, clematis. Um, lotus trees are taking over some of those uh, some of those areas too. And uh, my question is this: Is there a way that we can have an outreach program that maybe involve, involves s scouts? And we've got this great Girl Scout group and in Labyrinth Park uh, Scouts or uh, ROTC does make uh, some contributions in terms of our parks maintenance, uh, particularly at the cemetery. But if we could get uh, groups essentially that have an ongoing program like schools do 
that uh, they could make a commitment uh, over a long time period to once we we get these invasives down, but we aren't able to control them over a period of time and they get back. So that's one uh, major concern of mine. I'll pass along to John and Phil. And we've got a very active Boy Scout troop. Oh, yeah. Um, troop, troop 220 that, you know, that would be somebody to reach out to. I, it's different than a single scout service project. You're talking more like every six months as a troop go down and do yeah. a community service yes. event. Mm -hmm. yeah. Adopt a park. Right, that's a great thing for the city to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do, um, I, I request to have a report on the Um uh, Things that I have seen, which uh, were kind of neat, I, I, went on, I went on down to the Look at the intersection paving. Uh, there was a Jefferson and uh, I guess 11th, I guess it was, but uh, I guess it's you know, 11th. And it was very neat. Uh, I, I, and I, I, didn't know, I didn't know it was occurring until it already occurred, but it was great. Uh, went to the opening of the public uh, restrooms behind, uh, what are they called? The ice cat, uh, bar, um, anyway, the bar uh, on 12th and and 12th and Main. Ice House? I, Ice House, right. It's, it's behind that location. And if, if, you ought to go look at it because uh, they've done some nice exterior things to these restrooms that have uh, been put in basically to help the homeless people there. And uh, it, 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 it was, I thought it was pretty well attended um, by, by a couple of commissioners, uh, by the, the police, by uh, homeless people that were I think really appreciate it. I think there was at least 15 or 20 homeless people there that were there for the band thing. And I, I think it indicated their appreciation for having that facility available. Um, the other thing, I was able to get a walk through with uh, 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 Renee Harbor, who used to be the uh, director of the horticultural program at, uh, at the college and has now taken over the restoration of the Environmental Learning Center site. And that is progressing very, very nicely. It's gonna be a far better uh, facility for treating the water going out of that area. Uh, most of the water is actually coming from the high school, go into that facility as well as, as from uh, uh, half, of the, half, of the, half of the college. And uh, that is progressing nicely. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's all, that's all I have. Thanks, Dad. Roger. Oh, sorry. I was going to come back. Oh, oh, okay. Mixing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a Pioneer Center. Uh, uh, trip hazards and the sidewalks have been fixed. Fall classes begin this week. Uh, two new classes have started card uh, making and strength and balance. Uh, Gentle Yoga has 30 students. All the, all the hikes are, have, have been completed. Uh, flu shots are on Thursdays. Uh, cement work has begun on the curbs by the parking, within the parking strips. Um, okay, the foundation, uh, we have two projects we're working on. Um, we're, we've been ringing trees and pulling ivy in Waterport Park and um, we're currently working on getting a contractor to get it sprayed. Uh, we actually have one in mind, and but uh, we, we need to wait and go over the details with Phil and John, John, Jonathan Waverly. Um, we're also working on the, the south end of Promenade Park by the VFW. We uh, last Saturday we cleared approximately 138 feet of grass. Uh, which is borders the sidewalk and the parking lot that's in between. That area has just been rocks and grass and we are with the intention of planting, uh, well, <clears throat> we cleared the grass and today we started putting mulch on part of it. We got about a quarter, quarter done and it will continue on putting mulch down. And, uh, and then uh, in October, we hopefully will get some of the first plants in and then the remaining plants next spring. Um, my wife and I went to Port Townsend 
for the Bo Wooden Boat Festival, and I was uh, for a, for a town that is uh, it's a, another historic town like Oregon City, and they have a few more buildings left than we do downtown, which is it's just a beautiful town, and uh, it's just, it's a, it has a population of about 9,600 people, and uh, they have the Wooden Boat Festival, a Blues Festival, a Jazz Festival, and it's just a, a really pretty cool uh, city. I mean, uh, and it's besides the location of being on the Strait of Juan of Fuga. And uh, it was just, a, um, I encourage everybody to go to that wooden boat festival. It was just amazing. Um, because of my, my wife's interest in jewelry, we also ended up, uh, she had a show down in Corvallis. And um, so, and the, and the show was, uh, the art show was in, uh, let's see, Central Park in Corvallis. It's the first time I've been to Corvallis since moving to Oregon. And it's a pretty nice little town. But I, I was just impressed with that park because of the entrance and uh, they had a nice planting going in, which is just, you know, the, the park itself is natural, but they have, also has some plantings within the park. And, uh, and, and then I noticed that they still have, for the children, they still have sand in the play area. And it, but it was just teeming with kids in there. And, uh, that's, and the, the, the last thing I want to say is that uh, Rochelle and Melissa and that team during those concerts are just fabulous. I mean, the volunteers, they, they are just clockwork mm -hmm. on what they do. And it's just, the only thing, I, the only complaint I have is, is that the raffle tickets need to be mixed up better. <laughs> because, so you know, it's... <laughs> I'll pass that one off. Right. Could, could I make a comment? You know, they're using multi... They have different color raffle tickets, and so I know as soon as they're drawing and it's the wrong color. They should have the same color so I can look hopeful every time they're drawing. <laughs> I'll pass that along as well. I'm willing to be dashed. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be efficient with our money. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Sean? Uh, the only thing I have um, really is an email from Maureen at the library. Uh, Doug and I attended a meeting relating to the, uh, the signage um, issue there, and, and she has uh, gone out uh, kind of at, at the rec recommendation of the group uh, to uh, have a person produce some concept drawings, uh, and so that's in the works. And also that uh, she spoke with the city manager and that the city will be paying for the cost of the replacement. Nice. Okay. And that's it. Okay. And I don't have anything myself this evening, so we're on to staff reports. I think I have generated um, enough reporting tonight <laughs> and uh, provided you guys with the monthly um, reports. If you guys have questions on those. Otherwise, kind of keep it, okay. keep it tight tonight. I'd, I'd be curious sometime if somebody could tell me how many volunteers are involved in the, um, uh, the uh, Meals on Wheels delivery. I must, there must be several of them. Yeah, we have a tally that I can ask Kathy to bring to yeah. that. Yeah, when Kathy brings those numbers, they're just staggering. Yeah. Future agenda items. I have Doug's um, wanting the Ermatinger. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to recall. And the color of the raffle tickets? First part of Okay. Okay. If there's nothing else. Our next scheduled meeting is October 26th. And is there anything else? Then we can adjourn. Thank you.